Okay, so we're back to cups filters now. Um, and this is to reinstall and it's something that right, required post install. So really, being this is required post install, I'm going to install cups next because cups filters has got a dependency directly on cups. So I'll install this first. So actually a reinstallation. So I can skip that. We don't need to add the user or the group. We'll modify the current user. The current user will have that access still. You can see LP admin. Uh, that's the point. I'll just check to see if I can log in as this user uh, into the. How did you get the bookmarks up? Things it's in it. All oh, right, still remembering the root user. Unfortunately, can I log out? Right, let me do control Q. Now I have to log out and log back in again. Really. Um, Right, I'll have to test that another time. I'm not sure. I don't know. Actually, what I could do is to open the private window. Marks. No, it's still remembering it, strangely enough. Okay, what I might do is, if that closes down, I guess I'll quit this, I'll log out, and re-log in just to just save me having to kick off the browser manually. I'll open the tab. No, it's, it looks like it's re remembering it, unfortunately, so I can't test that. Uh, change settings. Okay, so now unfortunately it's something I can't test. Never mind, it's, there's a chance that it should work because that user, it, um, in my case, kernel text is part of um, the LP admin group so it should the context user should have access to the administration obviously that would probably be a lot better um, so we're doing cups right so we better put uh, if you didn't install XDG utils right we did so we don't need to do that If CLANG is installed, remove the warning. So we'll run that in. And then let's just copy the configure command and see what else we might want to add or remove. Setting these two, if you prefer to use GCC instead of CLANG, which is now preferred by the upstream. So is it saying that if it first uses Yeah, it's a bit ambiguous still that statement. Because it, is it saying if it first uses GCC, which is now preferred by the upstream, or CLANG, which is now preferred by upstream? Let's have a look. And, and we'll use what is preferred by upstream.
Let's see if anything here about compiling it. Right, let's try have a look at the readme. Try install. Right, it does actually refer to the GNU tools, but it looks like you'll need an NC compliance, C and C++ compilers. The GNU compiler tools and bash work well, and we have tested the current CUPS code against several versions of GCC with excellent results. So, that's the answer to the question. So, we do want to add these in. Um, it's a little bit surprising they haven't put them in in the uh, book, being that's recommended. So let's copy, we need to copy these two first, and then copy the configure command. And then we'll check the rest of it. So this is a groups admin. Disable lib USB. If you install lib USB, we wish to use a kernel USB LP driver. Right, so we've got lib paper. I can't remember what I was set for that lib USB before now. Um, because it's neither here nor there for me because I've got a USB printer but if that's important I suppose you've got to decide whether you want to use the kernel USB driver or the actual separate user space libUSB so I'm going to leave um, my settings as I was pro probably best to use a kernel but um, I guess that's a bit of a thing to decide yourself Okay, it's configured, so I'm going to run make now. It takes a few minutes, is it? Yeah, it does. Okay, that's finished. Um, so now let's run the tests. So it says make sure there's not another instance of cups running. So I need to disable 
to cap server. So I'll stop it and now run the tests. Okay, so that has finished testing and nothing seems to be wrong with that, seems to be passes. Um, we could look at this. File here, I guess. Um, So we can open that, let's get another tab up. So kernel text, I need to be in the root. Sources, BRFS, cups, and it says it's in the test directory. There it is there. So there's passes all the way down there. Oh, there's some skips. There's one fail there. Required printed description attributes. So it says, oh, that's if cups run. It doesn't mention any f other failure, so um, 
whether that's because I haven't got USB printers or the USB drives, I'm not sure. Um, so it's looking for different types of media. It could be the support for the papers not built in, maybe. Um, not too worried about that. I guess the test for that would be for me to print something, um, which I suppose I can do if I start the. I'll, I'll finish reinstalling this. I'll I'll restart and print a test page. Um, in fact, I'm not sure if there is a test page function within Cups. It could even be that Cups filters because this will be needed at runtime whether um yeah because this hasn't been installed but it, this cups filter is it runtime or well, post install at least um maybe something to do with that possibly um so let's just see they're still passed all the way down here test summary Log files, if you want to read them, looks like there's quite a few of them. Yeah, so that's all the log. So, it's uh, strange actually that there was a failure. So it's 100% there. That looks like a fail. There's no mention of failure here, so whether that's um, something that can't or is, is ignored by the test, um, it seems to be okay. Let's uh, just see what category that's under, what section. Examples 2.0 test IPP. Oh, right, so it's a newer version of IPP, so there's a chance that that's not implemented properly. Subscription risk. So it's under compliance tests, command tests. So version 2 of IPP files is where it failed. Um, again, like I said, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Once I've installed CUPS filters and finished installing CUPS, I'll do a test print um, just to check that it does work. I'm sure it will do. So let's do make install. Okay, and I'll recreate this link in case it's not there anymore, if it's been recovered. I'll remove this. Um, not sure why the two ampersands are there. I hope there's nothing else missing from that. Um, in fact, what I might do is just look at the cups on the development, see if that's been modified at all. So, I'll, in fact, can I duplicate this? Yes, I can. And um, I'm not sure if it's development. Change that stable to development. No, it isn't. So what I'm going to do is delete the URL back to the view. And no, it's not there. I'll have to go back 
to the BLFS homepage and then do read online and click on development here. Oh, it is under there, it was under SVN, under the view SVN. Okay, and I want to look for cups. Find the next one. So this is the exact same version. You can see the version's not changed currently. Um, obviously, if you come to look at the, if you're building 11 and you come to look at development, it could be that a new version's been re released and they've added that in. No, there's no change there still, so that's obviously not been detected, that typo. Okay. Um, and I'll just check the server name. I wouldn't have thought this would have changed, but I'll just check. So that's, yep, as it should be. And then I can run this command here. Uh, this doesn't make any difference at the moment. We will be making or will make a difference for um, some of the other desktop environments. So I'll just check this PAM file. It should be the same, but it's worth checking in case it's been overwritten by the installation. And that looks okay. Don't need to install the boot scripts again, but what I will do is to start up cups again. In fact, no, what I'll do is I'll leave it off and finish installing cups filters. Well, no, I better actually better start in case that needs it, come to think of it. So, there's the print server running again. I'll cross this off now. Shut that tab down and tidy up cups. And now extract cups filters. Okay, so first thing we've got is a configure command. So I'll copy that, just check the command explanations. So var here, I'll delete that because not a disable. It does say it'll, um, if you need network printer discovery capabilities. So I presume I didn't install it last time because as you saw, it found my network printer. Right, yeah, we can add that in. Test font value path if you wish to run the tests. So we've got the Deja Vu font set installed, if you remember. Installed that quite early on. So let's try that. Okay, let's have a quick look at these settings. Yep, that looks good. I can see a quick scan down, let's build it.
Okay, that has built. Um, just got to finish copying these. Um, now it looks like we could not also add in PDF to this. I haven't got the fig to def, the uh, fig to dev format uh, package for the PS format, but we can add in the PDF because we've got text live installed now. So I'll just add PDF to that command there. Um, don't know if it's working text, but right, okay, so it could be that I need to resource it's echoed on a path. It's because I've, yeah, it's because I've logged out. Um, so source etc profile. Now, if I echo the path, you can see I've got the text live in the path, so. Um, just see what, what, what happened here. Right, I'm assuming. The first two commands ran. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run them again because I'm not sure exactly what where that failed, but I'm assuming it is the last command. Let's just run these separately. I'm, I can't remember if these produce any output or not when they've run successfully. These uh, make info commands. See, that one hasn't. HTML, so PDF, I'll add in, right, yeah, so the output did come from that last command, that's why I wasn't sure, yeah, this is building now, so that's good. And I'll run, make check now, and wait for the test to finish.
Okay, that appears to have all tested okay, so I'm going to reinstall it now. Um, it does say that this overwrites a particular file. So what I could do is move it out of the way first. I'm not sure why it overwrites this or what difference it makes. Um, so I'll move it here. Oh, it doesn't even exist. So that's not a problem, obviously. So let's make install and install the documentation. And as it says here, we can install the additional documentation, but obviously we need to remove the PS version. As that wasn't built. That was interesting. There's DVI an option that can be installed or built. Let's try that and see if that's true or not. DVI. No, it can't do it. So... We have to remove that. Maybe that DVI comes with the P PS version. Okay, it's not doing the PDF version either. UPG PDF is definitely there. Let's just remove those curly brackets. Oops, PDF. Right, that's better. Oh, it was already there, right, it had done it. I'm not reading the screen close enough. Oh no, it does say not f no such file or directory. Ah, oh, right, it had actually copied it initially, and then it had failed. So the part of the command had completed. Okay, so that's all right. So can PG is done. Let's tidy up. What's going on here? My spacebar's not working correctly. Right, that's done. So GNU PG chapter four. Cross that off as complete. And the last rebuild for the time being at least is this as waiter theme. Uh, this straightforward build and install. And all I need to do now is to make Install and while it's installed, I'll cross that off as rebuilt.
Okay, that's finished installing, so tidy this up. And chapter 28, yes, I've already crossed it off. Close that tab down. And let's take this back to, what's this one here? Oh, that's the single page for you. Um, right, I'm just going to check to see that I've not missed any source directories. I've missed tidying them up, and it looks like I haven't, so that's okay. So what I'm going to do now is to reboot. Um, the machine's been up for quite a number of days. Um, obviously done a lot of work. Oh right, okay, so I forgot that I've rebooted it. Um, yes, there's a load of kernel rebuilds, but the fact it's been up for a while, I just want to reboot it. BLFS has been, uh, BLFS, CUPS has been reinstalled. <clears throat> and so I just want to make sure everything's fine uh, before we move into the next stage of building Linux from scratch. So, Control Q to shut down the browser, Control D a couple of times to come out of Xterm and the window manager, Control D to actually log out, and actually. Uh, I just remember the past didn't have text live yet. It has got text live in now. So I wonder if yes, text live has also been built as as well since we've rebooted. Possibly. Okay, so yeah, I'm now going to reboot and uh, then carry on with the next section. Okay, so I've got the chime, got the grub menu, and it's booting. So I'll just wait for this to boot up. You'll notice there's a few more um, boot scripts that are running now, all these here, and a few others that have gone off the screen. So back into the GUI, what I'm going to do for the next stage is to just review some of the packages um, that I want to install. Um, they're either minor applications like command line interface applications um, and then I'll move on to some of the slightly bigger applications um, and then I think I'll get on with doing the actual um, environment, GUI environment related stuff like the desktop environments and so on. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'll start with some of the command line utilities which can be quite useful to have around so um, they're probably going to be mostly in um, chapter 11 and 12 possibly, a lot of these, mostly 12 I would think actually taking a look. I've installed some already either through necessity or just happen to have been installed on the way to installing other stuff. Um, but I'm just looking through editors. There's a whole chapter on editors. There's about eight different editors there. Um, I'm happy with Vim and that's what I'll stick with but obviously if there's any others. Um, there is one there, Kate, which is part of the KDE suite. Um, so that will probably get installed when we do KDE but I know some people like Emacs, Nano seems to be quite popular because it's quite quite an easy editor to pick up. Um, so yeah, they're there if you want to install them. Um, just looking through, let's see what I can jump into next. Right, okay, the first general utility I'm going to install is called screen which is in chapter 11 and it's a 
a multiplex which allows you to um, create a session um, that can be detached from the terminal and you can pick that session up from uh, another terminal, completely different terminal, um, you know, physically different terminal, it could be a different building, different country even, um, that could be quite quite a useful thing to have. So let's look for that one. Um, that'll be prior to the oops, prior to this one. So there it is. There, I'll install that one, and let's see what else I can do at this point. Time. There is. I think the time that I've been using so far is part of Bash, I believe. But there is a separate program for my wheel stop moving the screen. A separate program that can be installed. Um, well it does say here that if you want a system that meets the LSB standards that this, this program is actually needed. So similar to which you can do it by other means um, but there is an actual program to provide functionality and it could be that provides more functionality possibly. Um, tree can be useful to display compact complex disk structures so I'll install that as a small utility. Uh, what else have we got here that I haven't installed? HD Palms useful for interrogating or setting ATA parameters. So install that one. Might not necessarily be useful in a desktop environment, but it could be if you're having issues or you've installed a new disk you want to check or you've got an external disk you plug in, you want to know what it does. Um just check this one, I think this is Midnight Commander. Yes it is, yeah, I'll install that, that can be useful. Um in a text only environment. Bear in mind, if something goes wrong with the GUI, you, you will be falling back to the text environment. So this is why I have these utils around uh, in case the worst happens. You can fall back on these utilities. Um, it's the only one that immediately obvious to install here is UNRA. In case, just in case there's any RAR files that are downloaded from the internet, which may have things in that we need to access. Um, programming, just looking through that. Um, some networking utilities, Nmap could be useful um, if you're doing network related stuff. Let's have a look at that one. Um, if any of these utilities requires things like GNOME or KDE, then I'll defer their installation until that point. But um, in theory, a lot of these shouldn't need, or most of them shouldn't need any GUI at all. Uh, yeah, Traceroute can be useful for tracing connections, and I'll install Wireshark as well can be useful. Uh, for looking at data in packets if you're developing or, or doing penetration testing, that sort of stuff, it could be useful. Um, what else should I install here? So really getting onto the X um, based stuff after that and a lot of the applications that appear after this are based on um, X. So although we've installed a couple like GIMP and Inkscape, um, there is a chance that some of these will rely on particular environments. Um, but I'll concentrate the, on these later. I might do these, have a look at these after I've done these command line utilities. <clears throat> um, I think Wireshark is a command line utility, but it has got a GUI interface as well. So we'll see see what these requirements are when I come to them. 
but I might install these before we move on to the actual um, desktop environments and so on, just to show that they do work in, in the simplest environment. So, yep, I think that'll do for now. So I'll go to the first one I've selected, which is screen, and download this. So there's no dependencies apart from PAM, which is an optional one. So I'll go into BLFS directory, Tarmus XVF screen. So run the patch in to fix some security vulnerabilities. And have we got any extra options here? No, we haven't. So I'll just copy and paste all this in. and wait for it to build. Okay, that's built, so there's nothing to test, just run this in, the make install command, and you can see there's some configuration files there, if needed, and that's screen installed. So screen basically works um, like this. You, you issue the command screen. I normally give the minus H uh, parameter with 999, which I think is the maximum for a history. So you get 9999 lines of history stored for each session. And what this will do, it will, it will spawn a new bash session, but this is within the screen session that I've just run. So if I do screen minus L, oh, no, that's not it. Um, screen minus, minus help, I can't remember what the command is. Uh, oh, is it LS, is it screen minus LS? Yeah, that shows the um, virtual terminals that are attached to the screen that's running or, or the how do I describe this the virtual terminals that are available and you can see the only one that I've spawned is the one I'm in at the moment um, and it actually says it, it's attached so that's the one that's available at the moment if I do control A and then press D it detaches that screen and you can see the prompts actually come back at the top of the screen and it says detach from and it's got the PID number and the terminal number, the virtual terminal number. So if I just clear the screen, if I now do screen uh, minus LS, it shows that terminal still there and that it's attached. And I can reattach that screen, i.e. go back into it and make it current by doing screen minus R. And you can see it's restored the screen as it was when I detached it. Now if, for example, I was running a command, for example, open SSL uh, test MD5. If I set that running, uh, open SSL, uh, not test, sorry, speed. So that's doing something. If I detach with Control A and D, again, the screen, I don't know why it keeps resetting to the top of the screen. But I can do other things now. I could close down the computer and then come back with, and type in screen minus R 
and that program's still been running in the background but I've just attached the screen and it could have completed I would have returned and I get the results on the screen so it's quite useful um, if I detach that I can spawn another session and this is now completely independent from the initial session that I spawned the screen from and the other uh, screen session that I've got running or yeah that I have got running that's had the open SSL command running in it so if I now run screen minus ls you can see that I've got the original session still active and running which is detached and the new session which I've just spawned which is obviously attached so I could do for example um, ls minus lra so if I get that running do control A and then press D to detach the screen. Screen, oh, let's do a clear first. All right, if I can type properly, clear for the screen minus LS again. You see they're both detached. I want to go back to the original one. Screen minus R, this time I specify the number 3053, and you see I've got that back. Uh, control A and D. If I do screen minus R on its own, it tells me there's several. Let's clear the screen again. There's more than one. It doesn't know which one it wants me to attach to. Now I want to attach to the most recent one. And you can see it's still running in the background. It doesn't stop at all. And it's actually just finished. To detach the screen, or sorry, to shut down the actual session, you just log out normally. So that that screen as you can see at the top it says screen is terminating that's now finished just clear generally this doesn't happen it just the responses just carry on on the bottom of the screen so I'm not sure what setting it might be TWN it might be X terminals doing that I'm not sure why that's happening but if I do screen minus LS you can see I've still got the other original session and I can once again resume that session and once again, control D or exit to terminate that screen session. And now if I do screen minus LS, you can see there's no sessions running. If I try to do screen minus R, it's, it tells me there's no screens to resume. So it is quite a useful um, utility. If you're working on the command line, you need extra terminals, virtual terminals or the best part if you need to start a program you know it's going to take a while to run and you want to turn off the computer or not turn off the computer turn off the screen and move somewhere else or even turn off the computer if you're accessing a remote pc it's really useful for that so what you do is you'd um, log into the remote terminal the remote computer fire up screen there run your command that you know is going to take a long time detach it log out go to sleep or whatever or go home um, log back into the remote computer system reattach the screen and your program will still be running and you'd still get the output on the screen as well really really useful um, I believe there is another one called Tmux which I see a lot of people talking about I've never used that one um, so whether it's better or more modern I don't know but uh, it's not in the BLFS book otherwise I would try that one I, I would like to see how that compares to screen but certainly screen is you know uh, good enough for uh, what I've used so if you want to find out about Tmux you might want to load it up in another distribution to find out about it so anyway that's screen done I'm gonna mark that off as complete in my list and move on to the next little utility which is time So download this. And extract it. So as you know, I've been typing time occasionally and it just basically, I think, like I say, it must be a built-in into Bash. So if I ran time on this configure, um, it'll obviously come up with a 
value at the end. Okay, so you can see that it took 27 seconds and there's a amount of time it's spent in user space and 9 seconds in in the kernel. I believe that's what the system part is. So again, I'll run time for make. And that's done. And now make install. And in theory, I don't know if this should work. Time minus minus help. Has installed it. User bin. So you can see that it's come up with different layout of the uh, time command. Um, it, it gives different output. I'm not sure why it hasn't put carriage returns after all of those, but maybe that's an option to do that. So that's just there because it's part of the LSB. So I'll tidy that one up and mark that off and move on to another simple utility but can be useful sometimes, which is tree. See how small it is and how simple it is to build. So install it. And that's it. I tied it up and it is just simply a case of typing in tree and you can see well it's listed to files but you can see they're all on the same level, but you can see there we've got a lib directory and it shows you the files within that directory. Same with the legacy. So if we did tree um, slash user, for example, uh, there is an option to stop it printing out the, the files. Uh, yeah, D minus D slash user. You can see there's the hierarchy under the user subdirectory you can see how complex it is uh, so that's quite a useful tool as well if you're um, man manipulating files in complex hierarchies it can be a real lifesaver to get a grip of um, where where files are at what levels and so on so it's a similar layout to what you'd see in a GUI really there's no difference to that so tree I'll mark that one off as well and Shut down that. Um, I just remembered one tool that I'm not sure I've seen on here actually. I thought it was in the book. I'm just going to let me look for it in the index, will be faster online. Is smart mon tool. Oh, right, it's under file systems. Yeah, this, this is really useful. Um, Let's load that up after HD Palm, I think. Uh, now, before we go on to HD Palm, let me just get this downloading. Uh, the wall in there is to be heated. You can damage um, IDE disks. Or when I say IDE, the SATA are included in that as well. Basically, ATA disks um, by setting incorrect parameters. So be really careful. Uh, I have. I, I use HD Palm as a quick and rough guide for benchmarking disk because it, it's got a couple of benchmarks for throughput and buffer throughput. Um, and I have used it for setting the um, default spin down. Some, some laptops especially 
set this to spin down after quite a short time and they set it so it's retained as a setting on the disc and HD Palm can do the same thing but you can also either delete that setting or or change the, the spin down time. Um, another thing you can do is some, I'm not sure if it's on modern disc but certainly IDE disc from a few years ago they used to have an acoustic management option where there was a setting where a, a manufacturer recommended setting for um, an acoustic level and what it does it, it affected how quickly the head moves so the head is reduced in speed to reduce the amount of sound that the hard disk produces um, and generally that's a figure of 128 out of 250 I think it is but you can also set it for, for, for performance to increase the head switching um, by setting it to 250 so um, you know if, sound, if the noise of the hard disk and, and to be quite honest not hard disk from the last 10 years haven't been particularly noisy compared, compared to what they were 25 30 years ago um, you know if that was an issue you could you know set that or if you just wanted performance didn't care about the ticking or rattling noises a hard disk made a spinning hard disk obviously then you could set it to maximum performance um, and there's a few other things on there you can interrogate the drive and get lots of technical details about it so it's quite good but as I say there is some quite dangerous commands um, available so uh, just yeah be warned so HD Palm, it's simply a case of running make. And then uh, sudo install. Uh, install. sudo that install command I meant. So if I type HD Palm on its own, okay, it's obviously been put in SBIN, so it's only the root can run it, so that's a good thing really. Um, I'll just become root semi-permanently. So HD Palm, you can see there's lots of commands there, um, and there's lots of extremely dangerous warnings there as well, and very dangerous and so on. So you can see there is some serious damage you can do. Um, there's another thing I forgot that's really useful, especially on SSDs um, and recent mechanical disks. When I say recent, maybe in the last five or ten years, um, there are these security options. If you do security help, you get a load more options appear. And there's a security arrays option in there, which is ideal for SSDs as a way for zeroing the sectors on there. Um, and it's um, a good way as well of zeroing sectors on a mechanical disk. Um, it's certainly preferred for an, an, H, uh, an SDD. No, sorry, an SSD. You don't want to be writing zeros to the sectors because you're only shortening the life of the SSD, you know, wearing out the um, gates that are on the on on the SSD. So that, that is another use that I use HD Palm for. Uh, I might do a separate video on that as a demonstration of uh, how to erase different disks using that command. Um, so yeah, that's HD Palm. So I use it for um, getting information about the disk. I can do minus I, um, specify a device. So obviously the only device on here at the moment is the hard disk. So you can see you can get some semi-technical stuff, you know, some geometry and information about the transfer speed of the disk and um, yeah, you can see it, it's not using any of the, it's got PIO modes available, so this is going back way into the mists of time the original ATA specification would have used PIO um, DMA modes so these are multi DMA and then UDMA is ultra DMA and you can see it's using the latest, for, well I'll say the latest, that's the last uh, PATA revision I believe, the UDMA 6. So although this might be a SATA 3 or 6 version, it's obviously using that, that command set. 
and it tells you there what what um, standards it, it um, conforms to. Uh, there's also a more detailed information. Uh, probably best to do it through less because there is a lot of information, and you can see it gives a a better layout, in my opinion, of a similar sort of information we've just seen, but in more detail. And in fact, it does it even says there that it's a solid state device? It recognises it. So there's no rotation rate, um, capacity in different formats, and you can see there's all the um, features it's got. So you can see it supports uh, SATA six. And there's some other information there about how long. So to security erase it because it's an SSD, it would only take two minutes to erase the whole drive, whereas an equivalent drive, a 500 gigabyte mechanical drive, might take an hour or two hours or something. So, and what was the other thing? Oh, yes, um, benchmarking. So again, there's two options for this. There's a lowercase t. Don't want to do that through less, and that does one of the types of yeah buffer disk reads, and I think the other one it does is cache disk reads. Uh, so although they might not have any intrinsic meaning by themselves, they they do have a meaning. Um, that one's obviously through the buffer, and this one's obviously through through a cache read. So it'll be a lot faster. Um, you can compare disk to disk. But it's obviously very synthetic, very simple loop. So it's just a guide, but it does give you some idea, a fairly accurate idea of how reasonable a, a disk will be in terms of performance. And normally these two options, I bulk them together, little t and big t, just to get an idea of both stats. And as I say, it's useful to compare. Um, and if you do compare, compare on the same system because things like memory, the CPU, cache and so on can have an effect on these figures. Maybe a small effect but it can can affect them. And another thing I do is I, I run them several times because the numbers can vary slightly as you can see. Um, the cache reads is altered slightly by 10 megaseconds so if you want um, a bit more accuracy just take an average of say 3 reads. So, so that's HD Palmer, so that's quite useful. Let's mark that one off in chapter 12. HD Palm. So the next one we've got is Smart One Tools. So this has got a few dependencies which we already have. Um, most of them are for downloading because there's a database which can be downloaded a database of hard disks. Um, I expect there'll be a cron job at the end of the instructions to keep that hardware list updated. Uh, oh, what well we've done, gone back to the mic commander. So let's extract smart mon tools. Yep, I have missed the F option. So there's the BFS script. Okay, so we'll just copy and paste this as it is, wait for that to finish building.
Okay, so that's finished compiling. Let's run the tests. That seemed okay, so let's do make install. And that's complete. So midnight command just right type in C. Oh, it looks like the uh characters aren't working properly in the X term. Uh, I'll press F ten and come out of that and what I'll do is I'll do control two, go to a new terminal. I'll log in here and it should display a lot better here. Um, uh, yeah, let's see. So you can see it's a two pane thing. You can do various things to copy and paste stuff from the left window to the right window and so on. Um, you can even go into so yeah, edit F4 to edit that file. It looks like it's empty. Um, let's try that one there, F4. Uh, so yeah, I could edit that if I wanted to. And so on, so it's quite a... And as you can see, you can do things like create directories. Uh, there's a menu. And there's other things to do here. So... That could be quite a useful environment to have as well to do some slightly more complex things um, with a bit of assistance as well rather than just relying on the um, command line. So that's Midnight Commander or MC. Let's mark that off in chapter 12. And close that tab. Now I'm going to go to Unra, which uh, may not be something that you use that often, but it can still be useful to have uh, on the system. Uh, seems like my mouse doesn't want to move right. So simple installation, run that command. And now let's install. And that's it, and as you can see, it's just one binary, so that's it. But at least we'll be able to extract raw files now, if um, any happen to be downloaded. <coughs> so I've crossed that one off in chapter 12. I'll clean it up and close the tab. Now I've got Nmap. Uh, oh, actually, it's got one dependency we need, so let's take a look at that one. And we build it with this command. And install it with these commands. That's done.
So that's chapter 9, Liblinia. Cross that off. Shut down the tab and we go back to end map. We've got all the other dependencies. So we'll build this just by copying and pasting the commands that are available. Okay, that's finished. If you want to wish to run the test suite, run the following command. Run that said, and then we have to run make check as the root user. some errors there <clears throat> I can't see where the failures are exactly Three failures. Check and diff. So it looks like there's this program here might have some issues. See specifically where the failures have occurred. I can't give any more information on that, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, again, if it's something that's important, it's not particularly important to me. Um, but if it's important to you, you'd have to uh, investigate that. Um, Nmap. I've uh, not used this for quite a while, but it's uh, quite a thorough um, tool for network um, procedures, um, do port scans and so on. Um, and I, I've not really used the other, I think I've used Netcats, but not used NPing or NDIF. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that. So. <coughs> Um, I'll mark that one off as done. And 
map. Shut that down and tidy up. Uh, the trace route next. This is quite a small package. Source forge again. So extract trace route. We'll just run make to build it and then these commands to install it. And it says the trace route one file it's deleted because it was installed by INET Utils and LFS and is no longer relevant. So that's why that happens and that's it. So trace route simply if I want to trace route to um links from scratch.org for example. Um okay it's a root based thing which is probably good. Okay, is it trace RT is it? I could never remember. I know I've misspelled it, that's what it is. Trace Right, yeah, it is. So you can see me going out over the internet, all the servers that I'm hopping over. Okay, well, it looks like it's not actually worked, so maybe some reason for that. Um, it may be that the um, LFS server is actually hosted on this one, I don't know. Um, but that's that, so I'm going to shut that down now and mark that off. Oh, where was it? There it is. Networking Utilities and Wireshark next. Okay, it's still going. some documentations here so let's have a look at that okay so I'm not sure let's download the PDFs um, so everyone cares user's guide as well I'm not sure if we'll need any other um, versions right there are some other dependencies we need here so let's clear that up let's do the ASCII doctor and Lua I think it's a different version of Lua to the one that's already been installed uh, let's check these kernel options I don't think I'll bother change, changing these if they're not set um, it's it's not really part of BLFS, I'm just doing this as a demonstration to show how to install some other packages that may be useful. Uh, so let's do grep. Well, config.net must already be set. I imagine this is already set, so let's grep for that in sources linux.config. 
bracket it is set, so that's okay. So let's have a look at these. So Ruby's installed. Save link as. So ASCII doctor. Test suite needs many Ruby gems beyond the scope of PLFS, so we can't test it. So we just install this. And that's done. So that's general utilities. Let's get doctor. Esky doc. I haven't got esky doc marked, but I just saw it there. Uh, better check that one. Yeah, the link is colored so have we got ASCII doc yes we have right so I've obviously missed marking that one off so that's good got that right so lure 5.4 5.2.4 4, sorry Patch. So this is Lua 5.2.4. We've got two versions of Lua. Uh, there's the previous one we installed 5.4.3. So I need to create this file here and install it with those commands. There's no other, other options. That's complete. The installation of this package is complex, so we use the dester method of installation. Then as a root user, oops, we run these two commands, and that's it. Five dot two dot four. So that's in chapter thirteen. Now we can build Wireshark. So I've already downloaded it as you've seen. Uh, so first thing you need to do is add a group for Wireshark. And no other options for the configure. So we'll just run these commands as they are.
Right, so that's finished compiling. There's no test suite, so we just have to install the package. And if you installed, uh, download any of the documentation files, install them with the following command. So let's try that. they called capital W wire shark so wire shark star and they go into that directory there now set the ownership and permissions of sensitive applications only to only allow authorised users and add new users to the Wireshark group. So obviously I'll add in my own unprivileged user. And as it says it will require you to log in and uh, log out and log in again to activate that group. So what I'll do for now is to just tidy that up and I'll log in again and that should give me access um, and if we've installed IP tables just make sure we don't filter them out um, if you want to exclude certain packets it's more efficient to do with IP tables than it is to Wireshark. There's a Wireshark user's guide there, but basically um, just run Wireshark to get the interface coming up. Interestingly, it's popped up the, <coughs> the window. I don't know what the difference is with this, with TWM, where the window appears, and other times the frame um, appears, and you have to set the frame uh, for it to load up, but that's basically the thing you select an interface and there's many options here I'm not going to go into that now so I'll quit this and mark that off in chapter 16 and that's the end of the command line packages that I'm going to install for now